Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. Today at the end of the episode, we will play a short story from one of my books. Don't even know what it's going to be. I'm going to be surprised as well. Probably something from Twisted Reunion, but you never know. We'll see what kind of mood I'm in when we get to that point. It's been about a month since I recorded one of these things. I'm going to be going to Europe with my family for the next 18 days. We leave tomorrow, so I figured might as well get this done. This trip is going to be all about vacation, not really working. Probably ride a little bit on the plane. I'm getting together my the different things that I want to knock out. Finally going to do the bios for the Best of Death Fest little CD booklet that is going to include 15 songs, the lyrics to 15 songs, and 15 bios of the bands. Been holding off on it forever, but I just got the artwork from Brian Ochoa today. This morning, he's still going to color it. We'll get that done on my trip. I'll do the, the rest of the bios, so we'll have that little thing out. That'll just be a little 99 cent thing. Probably make some special edition print copies of that. I'm also going to be working on the Abraxas Adventure Between the Worlds. That's my friend Nico's book. It's the first book in a 21 book, maybe even more series, Dark Fantasy. Pretty amazing. We talk all the time about it. But he's having me do the English version. I'll be writing that while in Germany and Italy. And as soon as I get back, he will have a lot more of the Try Not to Die Between the Worlds ready to go. We're working on that one together. He's coming up with a whole story. I'm going to help him with the writing of it. Together we'll co-author it. So that'll be pretty exciting. Um, and then might be one or two other small things that I'll work on on the plane. But I'm really going to focus on just being present, having a good time. Not worry about work. That's all I've been doing. Not worrying, but working. I finally got my store up with a lot of different products. I had a lot of people asking me for Try Not To Die shirts and hoodies. And I just was not getting it done. I, it was on my list of shit to do for so long. But thank you to Sammy, Crystal, all these different people that made me excited. Like, they're so excited about the series. I was like, okay, these people are that excited about it. If they want products, that means there's other people like them. Let's just go ahead and do it. So I finally did it. One of the things that helped with that is I've been doing cognitive behavior therapy. That's been awesome as far as dealing with anger type issues and reactions. So that helped a lot with that. But then I decided to take a look at success and my fear of success. I often feel like I sabotage myself. You know, there are so many things that I could have done differently throughout my career. Making money was never really a priority or an issue. And but a lot of it had to deal with a fear of success, a fear of rejection. So we took a look at that, worked through that, and now I'm feeling pretty fucking amazing. Everything is just firing on all cylinders. So not only am I feeling great emotionally, mentally, and physically, it is pretty awesome too. For the last month, I'd been taking it kind of easy on jiu-jitsu, missing a lot because of my left hip. It felt like I had a tear in there. Everything was painful. It felt like it was getting worse. So I went and got tattooed to force myself to take some time off. I just redid my death vest tattoo, the coloring on it, and my chest, the trying to die on my chest. Happy with how those turned out. But then I was able to return to training, I believe, last week. So I hit Thursday and Friday, felt awesome. And then I've done the last three days. I've only done half days. One of the really cool things that happened yesterday morning was there were three kids there. When I got there, they were all just sitting on the wall watching their parents train. But then I started warming up with them, had a fun time with them. It's like, man, if I could do that like 10, 15 minutes every day, being able to play with kids like that, that would be pretty awesome. That was a lot of fun. They enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. So yeah, that was really cool. But this morning I was hoping they were going to be there for my warm up, but they were not there. Maybe tomorrow. I think I am going to go in. We don't fly until nighttime. So I was like, yeah, you know what? I'll go train at 6 a.m. or 6.30. Depends on what time I get my ass in there. And uh, yeah, it should be pretty awesome. When in Germany and Italy, we're hoping to hit maybe one or two gyms, maybe three. We'll see. We are going with friends, Marika and Misha, who live outside of Frankfurt. I connected with Marika on her podcast, Child of the Library. This is before I even had considered going to Germany ever. And so she was a big reason why I decided to go to Germany to do the book fairs. We really hit it off. Her and her husband have come out here, spent time with my family. So we decided to do a little vacation with them. Pretty excited. They planned this whole thing. So we'll be meeting them Friday and then we'll be going to Italy. I believe we'll be going to three 
major cities in northern Italy and then back to Germany. So should be really cool. Should be a lot of fun. They're really cool people. So looking forward to that. And man, yeah, but everything has just been awesome. So a part of it is I'm still using the functional mushrooms, switch brands to a cheaper brand, but uh, yeah, I think it's only cost me 25 bucks a month for these gummies. They've made such a huge difference in my anxiety. I've been telling everyone about them. People that are starting to take them are getting good results. My integrative doctor was saying, yeah, everyone in the world should be taking some kind of mushroom that's going to, they could only benefit you. So I've been enjoying that. Got my hyperbaric oxygen chamber set up. I've done it maybe about four, I think of five sessions over the last maybe 10 days here. So probably every other day. Sometimes I just don't have time for it or don't feel like it. But that's really nice to be able to have that at home. And what else for my brain health? Not too much else has been going on. Like it's just, everything is doing pretty awesome. So between the therapy, between the HBOT, between healing my body, uh, yeah, just feeling good, feeling unstoppable. Last week, I finally put out a cell sheet. So this is the PDF that you can give to libraries or bookstores high schools, whatever, to ask them to carry these books. So it has all the information on my books, the Try Not to Die series, and then individual books. Last week in the newsletter, I was asking people to please send that to their library. So your local libraries, your bookstores, whatever. And then if you get the books in there, let me know, and I'd be happy to give you one of the products from my store. And now if you can get my books into a major bookseller or somewhere like Costco or Target or Walmart, I will give you an Amazon card as well. I will make it worth your while. I sincerely appreciate all the help. Crystal DeBoard has been awesome. She already wrote to all the libraries in West Virginia. And that's just amazing. Someone that would go out of their way like that. So thank you to everyone that cares enough about me, cares enough about the series to help me. That is on my website. That would be just go to marktulius.com. If you press on order, it'll have the PDF there. And if you're a librarian, if you're looking to buy the books, and get all that information there. I also have, like I was mentioning, my store is on marktoolies.com as well. Just click on store. You'll see all the different products. I have shirts, hoodies, puzzles, everything I could figure out, try not to die related. Still playing around, still making different things. Had a bikini I was messing around with. I was like, pulled it down. Wasn't so sure about it. So just trying to figure out exactly what we want. We will be having a brand new rash guard coming out very soon. That is being designed right now. Wes Levine, he designed it. He also came up with a really cool Try Not To Die logo. It's going to be part of the rash guard, but then it will also be probably the main thing on a couple of different shirts. Really excited about that. That book, Try Not To Die In The Tournament Of Mortem, is fucking awesome. We meet on that like once or uh, sometimes it's every week. Sometimes we'll miss one, but we just meet in person on that. We've already completely plotted it out. I think it's only about 7,000 words right now, but now is the easy part. Now that we know that ha what happens, now we're going to have fun actually writing it. So he's going to be working on that a little bit while I'm in Germany. And then when I get back, we'll go back through it, really hit that. I want to release that before uh, Christmas this year. And I believe we will hit that. So we'll have the rash cards for that. We'll have shirts for that. And we'll have the book by Christmas. Another thing I'm really excited about is Try Not to Die at Meadow Spire Mall by P.W. Foytz. Now, P.W. did this on his own. And he went fucking nuts. In our contract, I say generally, you know, shoot for 35, 45,000 words. These are smaller novellas. This dude gives me a 90,000 word survivor edition so this doesn't include the death scene but it is awesome i did not want to stop reading it his writing is beautiful the only thing we have to do with his writing is dumb it down a little bit i was telling him i was like dude if i don't know some of these words i guarantee you some of the readers aren't going to know them so and then just some minor minor shit but that's what's awesome i don't have to do anything with this book i don't have to like i'll work on the formatting i'll work i'm going to give it to i already gave it to lindsey smith She's editing the main story while PW is working on the while PW is finalizing the death scenes. I'll go through. I've already read through it. I've already put all my notes. I'll take a look at what Lindsay gives me back. I'll make sure she hit all the places that I had notes. If not, I'll add them in. Give it to PW. He'll give it back. And before you know it, we have another book. So that one should be out before October. So yeah, 
super exciting shit on the way. And then there's so many other books. So Robert Essig the other day was writing that he's, I think, on his third of the four stories in his Try Not to Die in This Damned House. Just so much cool shit. All these different books that are taking place. Uh, and it's just, now I see, I was like, okay, not only is the series growing and starting to get into libraries, starting to get into bookstores, but it is only going to get bigger with each and every book. You know, was, there's no going backwards. It's only going to grow. And having 2025 book already in development and knowing that there's probably going to be some other really big ones over the next couple of years also added to it. I was like, man, this is, this is cool. This feels really good. And it wouldn't be happening if it weren't for these co-authors, if it wasn't for my editor, Lindsay Smith, the other editors that I've had working on it, my father, my sister, P.W. Foytz, he's helped with editing all that. And especially all the readers. If it hadn't been for readers telling me how much fun they were having with the series, you know, letting me know how excited they are about it, I would have gone and started working on my other stuff. I would have put this to the side. The Try Not to Die books were always kind of a secondary thing. I wanted to work on my fiction, what I felt was more important. But now I was like, no, this is how I blow this thing up. Because not only is it going to help me in my career, but all my co-authors. So some of them don't need it. Like Duncan Ralston, he's already blowing up. He's got Womb. He's got all his other books. He's doing great. But some of these other authors, they may not have much. They may have one or two books. And so this is only going to help their career. Almost forgot, we just had a brand new book come out, Trying to Die in a Dark Fairy Tale. So that is now available in paperback and ebook. That story is pretty awesome. Fans are having a lot of fun with it. So if you like dark fantasy, pick up Trying to Die in a Dark Fairy Tale. All of my books are also on, you can get signed copies on marktulius.com. I forgot to mention that. And the ebooks are always cheaper through there as well. So I believe you can get all the ebooks except for at Ghostland on slash tag and the new one, Dark Fairy Tale. So those ones are not available in ebook on the store. Those are still exclusive to Amazon. Everything else is wide. So you can either get it on my store or at other platforms. So all kinds of cool shit happening. Pretty happy, pretty thrilled. Feel good knocking everything off my list. All these things that have been on my list for so long, finally getting them cleaned up, finally getting them done, thinking everything's looking nice and professional giving myself a lot more leeway, a lot more compassion because I realize, fuck, I'm one person and I'm trying to do quite a lot. Being able to take pride in that is something that I hadn't been able to do before. You know, I look at the books like, eh, you know, big deal, right? Self-published. I would, I'd always put myself down, but it's like, no, these are good books. The reviews show that they're good books. I need to take pride in putting them out there. So not only take pride in being an author, but also a publisher because I am publishing books and quite a few of them. So thank you guys for all the support. It has meant the world. I probably will not record in Germany. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Marika and I will do uh, something small. That might be cool. Otherwise I will be back on July 7th or 8th and I will record something then. Thank you guys for listening. We'll go out on a short story. It's going to be a surprise. I don't know what it's going to be. You will find out in a couple seconds. Going Dark. Between my podcast, nonfiction writing, and conversations with new friends, I'm often accused of oversharing. Usually the accusations are from my wife, who's usually right. Hell, even most of my short stories are just a few hundred words away from the truth. However, the sharing is worth it if someone can learn from my mistakes or relate to some of the same weaknesses and warped thoughts that I possess. Plus, making stuff up is my job. If something I admit to ever leads to trouble, then I'll say I was just pretending. Prove I wasn't. Now that we're all on the same page, I can tell you why I'm sitting in this parking lot, pounding my second tea of the morning and puffing on a vape pen. And yes, I'm fully aware that this reveal just dropped my masculinity rating at least three notches. But I also know Final Float has a strict sober policy. I didn't drive an hour just to be turned away for smelling like a dirty hippie. 
The first time I'd come here, I didn't know what to expect. Afraid my paranoia might kick in, I'd only had two or three hits. My editor, Anthony, the guy who first recommended floating, had warned me not to get high. He said the sensory deprivation alone could lift my writer's block that felt more like a mountain and kickstart a scary story. And although Anthony didn't say it, I'm sure he was hoping it'd help me pull my head out of my ass with Unlocking the Cage, my book on MMA athletes. It wasn't just Anthony who thought floating would be good for me. A bunch of my jiu-jitsu friends claimed it was great for recovery, exactly what my broken-down body needed. Even Irene, my therapist, said I should give it a shot. That she'd allow it to replace one of our weekly sessions. So keep all that in mind if you're the type of person who likes pointing fingers. There's no way one person's suggestion was going to convince me to do absolutely nothing for an hour with no light, sound, smell, and nearly no feeling. I had shit to do. Plus, not being able to write down story ideas drives me nuts. It's the reason I carry this pen and paper everywhere. Therapy without a prying shrink did sound better, though, and I figured the hour by myself would be an excellent time to work on my breathing. I'd just begun practicing yoga and was struggling with the concept of staying still. Do nothing and everything begins to happen. Talk to yourself. Quiet your mind. Allow the thoughts. Let them flow. Let them flood, drown you, hold you under. All right, enough of these thoughts. Let's take one last rip. Hold it. Hold it. Blow out all the bad thoughts with the smoke. The ones that make sleeping impossible. Now back to the first time. I barely smoked. Walked in, signed a release, and was shown to a room where I showered off remembering at the last second to grab the earplugs off the shelf. I wedged the pink plastic into my ear, feeling oddly reassured that no sea slugs could slide into my ear canals and birth babies in my brain. I imagined the ones from Try Not to Die at Grandma's house that multiply when cut in half and scurry inside every orifice. I looked everywhere but couldn't find any extra earplugs, a guarantee my butt would stay clinched the entire hour. That's when I knew this whole thing was a terrible idea. My brain goes to the dark side the first chance it gets. And that's with just the audio muted. Once the lights were off, I knew I'd revert to being a scared little six-year-old hiding under the sheets. I opened this small submarine-type door and a relaxing white light tricked me into stepping inside the six-by-eight tub the salt water only reaching halfway up my shin. I closed the door behind me and eased myself in super slow because I'd just pictured myself slipping, cracking my head on the wall and drowning face down, a crimson halo fanning from my skull. The water was the same temperature as my body, the Epsom salt preventing me from sinking. I recognized that the experience could have been soothing if the air wasn't so thick it was like trying to breathe through a wet towel. Without warning, the lights blinked off and panic nearly pulled me under. I blindly reached for the button and couldn't find it, suddenly afraid of what I might feel instead. I'd been stupid to smoke, my paranoia ramping up, my heart thumping so hard it rippled the water and thudded in my head. My breathing became ragged, and I worried that someone had accidentally hit the wrong switch and turned off the air. I was inches from the edge of an anxiety attack, but I wasn't ready to quit. I focused on the sensation of buoyancy, how I couldn't remember ever floating like this, not even as a child, how effortless it seemed, my lower half not dragging me down. My breathing eased as I spread out like a starfish, amazed at how much tension I was still holding on to. My breath began to flow and my body relaxed, my mind cutting in and out of the haze. My body did nothing, lost at sea, floating, one of the first lessons we taught our kids because of the pool. The fear of Jake drowning was the reason I wrote Safety First. 
my mind changed the channel, but not the genre. I began thinking that maybe what I was experiencing right then was what dying was like. Nothing but our soul, the real mind behind our brain. It's a scary thought being left with only yourself. Why I'd seen so many people go nuts in solitary confinement. But in solitary, at least you can move. You can feel. What if all that were gone? No stomach rumbling, no itchy nose, no bumping into a wall, no TV, radio, phone, book, or person for a distraction. Nothing but yourself. If given a choice, I'd rather blink out of existence than face myself forever. But right then, both ideas bummed me out. All my life I'd been obsessed with death, fascinated by it, terrified of it, wishing it would hurry up and claim me, until now. Now I'm finally enjoying it and wanting to delay death indefinitely for me and my loved ones. The tears slipped into the water, my mind calculating how little life was left, even if we're lucky, but knowing none of us are. There could never be enough days, and death's a mean motherfucker. It doesn't give a shit if you're cute or ugly, kind or cruel, alone or loved. I got mad at myself for wasting time thinking about shit that would only depress me. I'd come here to work, to transform emotions into a story. Instead of blocking the demons, I opened their cage and told them to have at it. I unleashed my mind, and it came back with giant spiders descending from the ceiling, a lurker creeping between my legs, and the water rising while mustard gas pumped in from above. Everything a rerun. Something I'd read, seen, or written. What made it worse was I couldn't take full credit for my own scenes. How many had Anthony suggested or improved upon? He was the better writer. He went to college for it, and the reviews for Nick the Saint are higher than those for any of my books. Except Try Not to Die, which he co-authored with me. And now he was telling me unlocking could never work the way I was writing it, which meant I'd wasted over two years trying to piece it together. How could I come up with any new tales of doom and destruction when I had that shit weighing me down? My right hand balled into a fist, and no better than my son, I banged it into the bottom of the tub. Unbelievable pain shot up my arm and blasted my brain. I popped upright and bit back a scream as a splash of water burned my eyes. There was a spray bottle, a washcloth somewhere in the tub, but I went for the door, my hands frantically feeling the entire wall before smacking the handle. I found the shower, washed out my eyes, then rinsed off the four-inch-long cat scratch down my right forearm, an angry red present from the day before. I powered up my phone because I was finished. I'd been in for less than 20 minutes, but I was done for the day. I swore I'd never come back. Yet, here I am. Third time's a charm. Yes, I realize I skipped the second time, but that's because I hate telling that part. I know it sounds crazy. Something even I wouldn't believe. Plus, it's time to head inside. It's such a beautiful day that I can't help feeling guilty Anthony won't ever see another one. Nine days after my first float was when I found out he had died. I'd been CC'd on an email sent from his wife. Heart attack. 36 years old and apparently healthy. Dropped dead teaching third period. As sad as his passing was, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal for me if I hadn't pride. I don't even know why I did. Everything got fucked up the moment I found out he died the same day I'd visited this place. And I only made things worse by bringing it up to Irene. I told her I knew I didn't have anything to do with Anthony's death, but I also made the mistake of saying, maybe, that sort of thing is possible. But we just don't know how to scientifically measure it yet. 
With all the meditation, yoga, and brain games, combined with the neurotrophics, maybe I'd tapped into that part of our brain we no longer used. Perhaps I'd opened new pathways. Irene looked at me like I was crazy. I told her I didn't say I believed that stuff. I was just saying maybe we don't know. What I did know was that blast of pain in the tub felt an awful lot like the rocket ride at the start of a DMT trip. Once Irene heard that, I couldn't backtrack. She made me return to final float, said I had to. I needed to conquer my fear and deal with the sad truth that my friend was gone. Not to mention how unhealthy it was for me to entertain a delusion that fueled my guilt. Knowing how much I detest being mentally weak, Irene asked point blank if I was too scared to try again. And before I could answer, she said she'd count it as two sessions with her. Yeah, that second time I'd been scared. You probably would be too if you thought you might have accidentally killed someone. But like I said before, I'm not going to get into it. That's all behind me, and today's a good day. I know I can handle the tank. All anxiety has been alleviated. I'm no longer scared of the dark. And the unknown has a way of revealing itself to those brave enough to explore it. The waiting room is beautiful, full of comfy couches to settle in. Donnie, the surfer-looking dude at the front desk, says, What's up? Doesn't say a word about me looking high as hell. It's only ten in the morning, so maybe he thinks I'm still tired. Usually, I'm terrible with names, but Donnie's the same guy who cleaned up after my second visit. I hooked him up with a fat tip, and he never questioned my story about all the blood. Donnie says, they're still readying my room. It'll be a few minutes. I say, that's cool, and head over to the couch, pretending I'm going to write something important on my notepad. I hate being on a phone, especially in this kind of place where everyone's trying to be all zen. But this is important. Writers are warned to never check reviews of their work, especially those by average Joes. But reviews are the lifeblood of an independent author. You should always keep an eye out for those that would do you harm. I click on the one-star reviews, fortunately a small group to choose from. Looks like only one of the Joes has the courage to use his real name. It is quite possible that Mr. Painter simply does not care for my work, something I totally get. There are plenty of talented authors that I'll never read because of my varied interests. I'm guessing, however, that this guy has a habit of being toxic and spreading negativity. Donnie calls me, says, Room 6 is ready. I palm my phone and try to tread quietly down the hallway, but my sandals slap with every step. Inside the room, I lock the door, get undressed, and stack my clothes on the bench. I'm skipping the shower because I doubt they have cameras and I want to get started. I throw in the earplugs and pick up my wallet. I'm careful not to cut myself when I reach behind my business cards and slide out the razor blade. I've carried one all my life because you never know when it might come in handy. This is the same one I used in the last session sort of a lucky charm. While working as a correctional officer, I got to see just what these bad boys can do. I watched one guy bleed out on his toilet, just sat there looking at me, his femoral artery pissing away his life. Another guy gave himself the widest smile ever, only six inches too low. The guys with no imagination always went for their wrists. But that's not my thing. To be completely honest, I do enjoy teasing the tip over those places, the vital spots where one simple slice could end it all. But that's not where I cut myself. Who are we kidding? We all knew I'd get into the details of my... On trip two, I had only been in the tank about ten minutes when I let the blade do its little dance, dragging it out so I could finalize my thoughts, crystallize Irene's face, the look that said she thought I was crazy. Part of me felt awful, the other part foolish. There are plenty of people that I wouldn't mind seeing dead. But there wasn't anyone I'd wish it on. 
The new peaceful me tries not to hate. And really, what's the rush when we're all headed to the same place? However, I'm human, and I needed to know what I was capable of, what we as a species are capable of, and Irene wrote things down that could incriminate me, or at least set me up for some nasty blackmail. So yeah, Irene seemed like a decent person who probably didn't deserve it, but I'd already come so far, had the tip of the razor pressed against my ribs, an inch below the water's surface. I started my mantra. She wasn't a friend. She wasn't a person. She was an enemy that could destroy me and my family. At the height of my fury, I nicked my skin, but couldn't control my reaction, the blade scraping bone when I jumped. With the lights on, the tub looked like a living lava lamp, my blood spreading throughout the solution. Crazy Glue did the trick, and I got away with no stitches. Irene didn't fare quite as well, but like I said, she was the one who forced me to go. My therapy with her was court-ordered, so it was never like I had a choice. But with Mr. Painter here, there was an ethical dilemma. I don't even know the man. That's why I had to be extra sure and read some more reviews. It's what I figured. Painter's your typical troll, loathing everything that displeases him. It's crazy how much you can find out about someone in just a couple of clicks. I'm pretty sure I only need his name and face, but I don't want to be irresponsible. And I'll need all his info when I check in on him later today to see if he still has a heartbeat.